I love that. So now that we have our studio, um, I have to communicate with Kathy that way. So good evening, everyone. Happy New Year to you. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. And thank you, Nick, for coming to see us. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it's always a pleasure. We all we go back to Nick's very first book um, when I got a phone call from his publicist saying, well, I mean, I don't, I don't want to put this badly, but I will <laughs> say it's doing better than we thought, so we'd like to send him somewhere. So are you willing to take him, you know, on very short-term notice? I said, well, of course. Because we live for debuts. You know, nothing is more fun for us. Well, that's not true. It's it's wonderful for us to get to meet new authors. And the truth is, if you don't get to meet them when they start, you never get that whole trajectory. Mm -hmm. You know, so we have managed to do that now. Yeah, for how many books is this? Number this seven? Is book seven. Yeah. Book yeah. seven. Lucky number seven. Yeah. And it's really lucky number seven because Nick got a rave review in the New York Times yeah. on Sunday, which I thought was... Um, you know, he's, you can compare Peter Ash to Jack Reacher, but it's nice when somebody in the New York Times compares <laughs> Peter Ash to Jack Reacher. Um, but at the same time, um, I did think the way Sarah ended that up was really good when she said, you know that Peter's not going to take a bullet, you know, in the forehead, and he will live to return. But at the same time, Nick has created a real sense of danger and you know, and stakes that feel real. It's not just, you know, like some comic book version. Well, that, I, that's kind of the, for me, that's the whole idea, is for those characters to feel real. A thriller isn't very thrilling if you don't care about the, the characters and if they don't feel like they're at risk. So that's, to me, that's the whole idea, um, is to have them be, to feel mortal in, in, a, in the way that, that, I guess, not every character does. So when we met Peter, how many of you have read all of them? Have any of you read them all? Oh, good. Okay. So you recall when he was kind of living under the porch and, you know, didn't have <laughs> regular employment and all the rest of it. Uh, he's come a long way now because, you know, now he's got June and he's got Lewis and you know, all this other stuff. But anyway, I really like the first book. But I, I still say that the opening scenes of the second book, Burning Bright, were, were maybe the most exciting thriller chase. Remember across the trees? Um, I I just I I I've I've never read anything quite so good, as far as that you know. I mean, and and it went on for a long time too. It was many pages. It wasn't like just he hopped from a tree. But I mean, you you he raced across those trees for pages. Yeah, that was a lot of fun to do. Um, uh, I'm a tree climber from way way back. Although I've never climbed a redwood, but. Uh, I, that was a huge chunk of my childhood was climbing trees. Where? Yeah, uh, Wisconsin. Okay, but well, yeah. they have real trees. They do. They have. Oh well, yeah, not. They, you don't really have those sorts of trees here, but. Yeah. I grew up not far from you. I know. Remember? I know. So I used to climb. I used to hang out of the apple tree in our backyard. I can remember. I used to practice like hanging by my heels, hanging by my knees. <laughs> we had in Chicago. We had serious trees too. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I understand about. Trees. I still think every time I walk out into my backyard and look up at the palm trees and all that I'm on vacation. <laughs> I just if you grew up if you grew up in Chicago, you always feel like you're on vacation if you're somewhere what? like Arizona. That's a fine way to live. Yeah. That's a well, fine it really way is. To live. Yeah. There there's some drive for you to come to see me in January. Oh well. I, I would say the order of of uh, priority for me is Barbara one, bookstore two, readers three, dinner afterwards. Dinner, right, right. it's the four. whole package yes, here. Yes. Many of you may have, may have heard me say this, but it's true that one of the biggest reasons the authors come to the Poison Pen is dinner. It's the after party that, that <laughs> the sometimes after party. my husband, Ace, my husband will be cooking for Ace on Saturday because Ace wants to meet the puppies. It's too late, if Ace is at four. If we were doing this at an earlier hour, we'll do that another time, right. But anyway, um, we do, and and one reason that we really have such great relationships with authors is that you know we take time to get to know them, and they take time to get to know us, and right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, authors often do something that's called a radio tour, um, where there's a whole day full of um, five to ten minute, you know, uh, drive time shock jock radio interviews and podcasts and, and uh, all that kind of stuff. And, and the, there's such a difference between the, the five-minute, you know, zoo in the morning 
well, Vic Petrie's here, and we're talking about his new book. It's, just, it's, it's, and they've clearly never read it, and may have never read a book in their lives. Um, and I'm, and I'm, I'm certainly grateful for the exposure, uh, and I try to talk coherently about my book in five minutes. Um, but it's such a different experience to come here and talk to real readers. And Barbara, who has been so influential in the world of books, um, and who actually reads your books, yes, cover to cover. Yes, which I appreciate. Yeah, I told you, or maybe I haven't, maybe some of you heard me say that Dave Barry, who, you know, is a terrific writer, wrote a thriller about a guy. <laughs> I don't know if any of you ever read it. It was about a guy in Florida who lived in a tree and his job was voting. He took money for voting. This is, <laughs> was, this that, is, was that big trouble? Yep. That was it. And this was long before Trump. But anyway, so the little guy, he seriously lived in a tree, and that's how he made his living, was voting. Uh, but anyway, um, so we had a, a little TV show over at the Scottsdale Library, and that which led, in fact, to our whole you know video thing we've been doing for over 20 years. So um, it was the most popular show on the city TV channel, but they shut it down because somebody in the council thought that it wasn't fair that a business got free exposure. Now, I never mentioned the poison pen. It was totally free programming by some really famous people, but I'm sure this councilman didn't read. Anyway, so Dave Berry is scheduled to interview with me, and on that day when he's flying in to do that in the afternoon before we do our event here at the store, he's on the Today Show. So when Dave got here, I said to him, I got up this morning at five, I said, and terrified myself by watching you on the Today Show. <laughs> And he looked at me with this big smile, and he said, you know, that was all about them. He said, but this is going to be all about me, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which was really kind, because, you know, he put me at ease. But nonetheless, he was not kidding that, you know, as you point out, those guys don't have time to read books. And, no, you know, it's just, it's a whole different, it's a whole different thing. Yeah, it is. Well, let's go back to the book. So number two is when, if I remember right, Peter meets June. Yes. All right, yeah. so... Why did you decide to progress him from a guy living under the porch with the occasional dog or whatever? <laughs> um, why did you decide that you were going to start adding characters? Is that is that a necessary part of writing a series? I, I don't know. Um, that's actually a really interesting question. The June appeared in the second book. I, I give myself an assignment for every book, and, and the assignment for that book was Peter Falls in Love. Um, and because Peter is an itinerant character, um, I... I you know, he, he couldn't have the same person. Like, he, he was, um, he, had a, he had an affair, sort of, kind of, off-screen in the first book, um, at the very end. Um, but because Peter moves on, there had to be a new person, and I had to figure out the, the kind of person that would work with him and with his, you know, he, he's a challenging person, for sure. Um, and so he needed a really strong partner. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, but, but, and I thought I was actually, I thought the next book, June, wouldn't be in. I thought I was, I would, I'd be done One with June done. for a while. Well, because at the end of the second book, a little bit of a spoiler, she says, basically, uh, come back when you get your shit together. Uh, cause he didn't really have his shit together. Um, nor was he really ever going no, to. No, he, he, he may never get his shit together. He's, he's making progress though. Um, a guy can, a guy can hope. But so I sort of thought, well, I'm, then June is not going to be in the next book. But I, I, I tried and tried to write a book that didn't have her in it, and it just did not cohere. You, once you met her, you couldn't ditch her. Yes, yes. And, and so there are really only three recurring characters anyway. There's Lewis, right. who we meet in the first book, and there's June, who we meet in the second book. And I, I, my goal is to have, is every, with every book, to have a character who you would want to see again. Um, to have a character that the reader likes enough um, and or is uh, compelling enough, uh, maybe in a bad way, hmm. to come back. Um, and I, that's sort of my goal with those secondary characters. But, but I, don't, I don't think I've written enough books to get to sort of do some of that yet. Um, but like Eli from the Memphis book, I would love to see what Eli's life is like, you know, five years later, ten years later. Um, you know, there's a, a actually a, a, one of the uh, bad guys who's sort of a sort of a government, uh, an undercover government assassin on the spectrum from from the second book, right. um, Shepard, who I always thought would have be fun to come back and sort of join the team again mm -hmm. for, for for a book. Um, so I have all of these characters I want to see again, but 
there's so much more flexibility if you only have a couple of recurring characters to keep track of, to show the development of. Um, and I'm always, uh, I, I'm always worried that I'm going to be repeating myself. So being able to go someplace new and introduce a lot of new characters is a, is a way that helps me feel better about it, at least. Well, that's where the Jack Reacher parallel comes in, in part, is that, you know, every, every book you read teeters in some place new. So you avoid a lot of baggage that way, but of course you get a lot of challenges. So let's see, in book three, we are, is it Wyoming, where they're running the, um, I don't want to talk um, about the plot too much. Where um, are we? Colorado? Colorado. 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 Well, close. Okay, so Middle America, that's another thing that you write about more often mm -hmm. than many authors. You know, you're, instead of being coastal, um, you're in Middle America. So it's Colorado, and, you know, since you wrote that book, we've legalized cannabis here. And I'm, but I'm not sure that you can yet bank the money. Is it, what what's happened with that now that I, it's legal? Well, there was um, the, the the when Obama was president, there were some there was some talk about sort of basically decriminalizing the process for banks. So, in case you're not following this, um, it, it it the states have made it legal. Some states have made it legal. Colorado to, being one. Colorado yeah. being one. It was the first one to really go all in, which is why that book is set in Colorado. Right. Um, to to sell cannabis on a state level, but but federal banks, bank any financial institution with a federal charter could not accept that money under federal law, and right. so basically uh, you were people were doing all of these transactions in cash. You couldn't use a credit card because again, national organization, right? Um, so that was part of the premise of the book. Is there is there are all of these companies that sprung up. Um, many of them run by veterans to basically protect the the pop guys um, and to shepherd their money from place to place. Um, but so there was a um, there, there's a company in uh, in Washington State that and I'm not sure if it's still happening where you it was this crazy thing you would use your credit you could use your credit card you walk into the into the pot store and you say I'd like a hundred dollars of whatever. And but you don't buy pot with it; you buy Bitcoin with it. And then the, the Bitcoin is is immediately sold, right, to this other company. And that so it's just a it's a you know lightning fast transaction. There's but it's a and I'm not sure if that ever became legal or if that's become widespread. I sort of I lost track of that. I haven't heard about that here in Arizona, but then I haven't patronized. I'll ask. I'll ask. Them. <laughs> Right, I'll ask my husband. Uh, okay, well, anyway, so we're in Colorado, um, and that was an interesting plot. And then I'm trying, was the fourth one Memphis? The fourth one was the Memphis. The fourth one yeah. was Memphis, and then Iceland. And then Iceland. Right, so, I mean, not only is he traveling, but he's actually out of the country. What Remind me, what was the inspiration that you just wanted to go to Iceland? You went there with your son. I went was there with my it? son. That was it exactly. Okay. He, he was, um, I think, 17, and he'd been lobbying, or maybe he was 16. He'd been lobbying hard to go to Iceland. He's a photographer, and there are all, there's all this, you know, Iceland porn out there with these gorgeous, you know, mountains and waterfalls. And, um, and so we went on a, a five-day backpacking trip. Um, we were there 11 days, and we went uh, across the Hornstrandir Peninsula, which is the far northwestern corner um, that's a nature preserve. And it was just gorgeous and stunning, and our, my feet were wet for five days, and we were cold and hungry, and it was glorious. Um, I'm going to tell you a lot about me, I guess. Um, but in the airport on the way home, and then we did some driving, and, and, and um, there's a great bookstore that my son found and he, he, where you can buy books by the kilogram. I love that. So he brought home... Uh, several kilos of books um, in Icelandic, by the way, uh, which we do not speak. Um, but in the airport, this idea for this book just sort of showed up, and I did not, um, I mean, I kind of scribbled it down, and I, you know, I had about 20 minutes with this idea, like, living in my head, and then it just disappeared. Um, it's kind of what happened. So I had my notes, and it was like, okay, here's the book, and I'm going to sort of reconstruct it from my notes, and that was the book where I missed my deadline by eight months. Right. Um, because it turns out that's not how I actually write books. I don't write from a plan. I sort of start at the beginning and write to the end. I, I make it up as I go along. And, and it was uh, it was really difficult. Um, but I really love that book. 
well, you had some very interesting relationships. I mean, I've been to Iceland several times, and um, I have a, I'll tell you at dinner, a great story about <clears throat> my daughter, the photographer, who disappeared over a cliff in pursuit of a puffin, and I sat there thinking, how am I ever going to explain to her husband and my father oh my that my goodness. child has gone into oh the Atlantic <laughs> on my watch? You know, because that's your big fear when you're a mom, is yeah. your kid's going to drown in the bathtub yeah. while you're on the phone, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's a fairly scary thing. And so here I thought, she's all brought up. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Like, and then she appeared back over the cliff <laughs> and won contests for her puffin pictures. Oh, nice. uh, yeah, fabulous. Nice. But anyway, um, so now we're, then we come back to Milwaukee. Right. Right. So now you're, like, home. Right. And that was kind of a COVID decision because it was hard to travel. Um, and so I thought, well, I already live in Milwaukee, so I can write about Milwaukee again. Um, and that was another technology book. Right. Um, and so I was playing with Milwaukee. It used to be known as the machine shop for the world. That was Milwaukee's, uh, one of Milwaukee's many names for a while. I thought it was the beer shop of the world. Uh, well, it was, I don't know about the brewery part, but the Cream City we we're also known as mm -hmm. because of our dairy right there. But, um, but yeah, we had, I don't know, I think more breweries per capita. In, yeah. in Milwaukee for, for many years, all the all the Germans. I remember living near it, you know, yeah. and yeah. yeah. There's a lot of great things about Wisconsin. I mean, I'm really going to digress here, but <laughs> you're not old enough to remember this, the Great Margarine War, because there was, margarine was white, and that was how the dairy industry lived with margarine, because it didn't look like butter. And along came a proposal, and it came with a little orange you would buy the margarine, packet, yeah. and it had a little packet of orange liquid if you massaged it into the margarine so it turned yellow, looked like butter. I'm telling you, it was a war. I mean, Wisconsin, Wisconsin's a very interesting state it in is any respect. State. Currently, you have a judge that should be disbarred, but moving on from that. Right. Yeah. Um, so from Milwaukee, now we're back in, where are we, in Nebraska when this book opens, uh, or South Dakota? Uh, Nebraska is We are is in Nebraska, where, the corn state. Or, no, it's Iowa. What do we call the, uh, what what's Nebraska? My father was born in Alliance, Nebraska. You'd think I could remember this. I, you know, that's a factoid I do not have at my command. Isn't Iowa the corn state? Don't I have that right? What's, what's Nebraska? Well, the Nebraska, on, the Nebraska corn Cornhuskers is there. Yeah. That's the football team. Yeah, I know, team. but... Well, I can do this. I don't know. I you look can... it up while we, <laughs> while we talk about Nebraska. So, right. I mean, why did you pick Nebraska? Because it's sort of wide open, endless miles? Uh, in part, yeah. My, so, again, my son had gone on a road trip with a couple of friends, and I had seen his pictures, um, and they sort of captured me. And, and I was reading about sort of farm country and the Midwest. I, the last book had been very urban, and so I wanted to do something that was, I'm usually reacting uh, sort of, from the previous book. So I wanted to do something more rural, um, and I wanted to do something um, that was more intimate, that was a, that was a kind of a smaller story. The, the, some of the previous books have had, uh, you know, very, very big consequences. And I wanted to do something that was really um, kind of down to one person's souls, kind of what this book yeah. comes down to. Um, and so, you know, reading about farm country, and it's, I mean, it's gorgeous. I don't know if anybody's driven through, you know, uh, Nebraska. Uh, yeah. It is the Cornhusker State. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the, it, it's, it's beautiful, and it's so open, and the sky is so huge. Um, and it's, but it also, you feel like a little speck in a way that, like in farm country in Wisconsin, you know, we have a lot more topography, and we have a lot yeah. more trees, and so you. And barns. And barns. Serious um, barns. And, 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 and so in. in Lakes, too. Yep. But so you the the horizon is smaller right. there, mm -hmm. um, and so uh, you know I, I ended up writing about um, you know really about sort of isolation and sort of hardship in in a in a very kind of you know farm country rural America way where the the jobs are dwindling the cities the towns are shrinking um, in some places you you drive an hour to go to the grocery store. Um, and so it, that's sort of the feeling that I'm trying to capture is where you both feel so small in, in comparison to the landscape, but you also feel sort of trapped and hemmed in um, because of your circumstances. Um, so Helene, when we meet her, so there's, there's, a, there's another character in this book who has almost as much time on the page as Peter does. Mm -hmm. um, and when we meet her, she's working uh, the, the night shift at a, at a rural gas station. 
um, at, the, at the far western edge of the Great Plains. Um, and there are only two people left in this town. There's her and there's her boss, who, who owns the, the gas station. He owns the trailer that she rents from him, and he's also a, a deputy sheriff. So he really feels like he uh, kind of owns her. Um, and he's getting increasingly obnoxious, and she really decides that she needs to get out of there. And at, at a certain point, a, a, a man comes in for gas in the middle of the night, and... Um, and he's driving a big rig. He's, he's, driving a, he's driving a big truck. He's got, he can, got double gas tanks. He can go a long, long way. And she realizes that this is her only opportunity to get away from her circumstances. And so she, she walks out to, to, to the pump and says, hey, mister, take me with you. Um, and he says, well, where do you want to go? And she says, anywhere but here. Uh, and so that's sort of that sense of being closed in and needing to escape. Um, and that was kind of the start of the, I mean, it's the, first, it's the first section of the book. And that was the first thing that I wrote. And then, the, of course, the challenge is to find the next thing. Uh, it's the problem when you, when you write by the seat of your pants like I do. Right. So I don't know how far we can carry this anyway. He's an attractive guy. And he's spending a fortune on fuel because it's well, a and, and he's, and he's nice to her yep he's, he's he's kind to her which doesn't happen a lot in her world no and compared to the guy she's trying to escape from yeah her mom has died she's all alone i mean she has no family and no money and you know no real skill set i mean so she's truly in the dead end to a remarkable degree right yeah uh, so anyway off they drive and then we can't really tell you what happens after that. <laughs> but he's an interesting character, too. Did you see him as he is at the beginning, or did he evolve without talking about what he evolved into? I, I didn't quite. I, I knew he was a bad, bad man. Oh, come on. You already blew it. <laughs> but, but, I, but, I, well, but I didn't know, I didn't know why or how. Yeah. I, just, I just knew that, that, that Helene thought she was saving herself, and in fact, she was, she was uh, get, getting into a worse, a it's worse a condition. It's a proverbial out of the frying right. pan yeah. moment, right. right? Which is kind of my job is to, to well, do that. Well, no, me. that that's true. But on the other hand, um, maybe a more conventional person, or a person that was traveling with family, or in a, or in a car, or something, would not have would not have taken her. You know, so I mean that that's always the gamble yeah. is that a guy yeah. was actually willing to take this girl in that situation. Right. Um, maybe there was always going to be something suspect right. about him. Right. So when Peter meets her, when Peter meets her, she's enormously pregnant. I mean, ready to pop, so to speak. So to speak. So to speak. I'm glad you said that, not me. Why is it a female <laughs> thing? I get to. <laughs> I've been enormously pregnant. I, I, I once said something like that to my wife, and she was not happy. Yeah. Oh, well, maybe her experience was worse than mine. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, um, and there she is. So you you don't know. She's driving a, what, a car, isn't it? Not a truck. Yeah, Peter's she, driving a truck. Peter, she, Peter's driving his, his 1968 Chevy pickup, okay. and she's driving a car that stopped running. Right. And they are in a kind of interesting, what, bottomland situation? Yeah, they're by the Missouri River at a, right. at a gravel road. Um, and Peter is making his way back. He's just picked up his truck. He's making his way back to see June. Uh, but, how, you know, a, a pregnant woman asks you for a lift. I mean, what, what are you supposed to do? It's not Peter's fault that he helped. That's all I'm saying. Because <laughs> June, June gets a little irate when Peter gets into trouble. But it's not his fault. It's just how he's built. It's just how he's made. So would you have done that? Would you, if you've been driving your truck across oh, the wilds sure. of Nebraska, oh, a sure. pregnant I, I, woman? I, I have done equally stupid things. Uh, I thought you were going to say chivalrous. Well, chivalrous, yes. Yeah. Well, some chivalrous things are actually stupid if yeah, you really yeah, think yeah. about them. So, but, but so that's the thing about about uh, places where that are not that are they're very sparsely populated. Yeah. Is that it takes a long time for help to show up. And so you have to help your neighbors. You have to, you, you know, I've, I've run into this on uh, backpacking where you run into somebody who's in trouble. And it's like, okay, we're going to change our plan. We're going to divert ourselves because who else is going to help? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think that's a, I think that's a, uh, maybe it's a lost, a, it's no longer a commonplace thing. But I used to pull over to help people with breakdowns. Not that I know anything about how to fix cars, but 
um, you know, I'd give you a ride to the gas station or, or any of those things. Um, so I, I'm a big believer in that. Well, we're in a litigious society. I think that being good Samaritans has become riskier um, than it used to be. Yeah. But yeah, I think I think most people are willing to help if you know there's some something right yeah. at hand and no immediate help in sight. Even if it's to stop and use your phone to call right. for help. But of right. course, if you're in the Missouri bottomlands, you know, right. there's um, no signal. There's well, not only no signal, but probably no help. Right, that's no help going to be, be had, yeah. close enough to do. Anyhow, but you know, you've, you've touched on one of the problems I think that thriller writers and I'll have to address, which is in a technological age, you know, what do you do? Um, you have to come up with reasons to disable telephones and um, and other stuff. Actually, I was having a conversation, we had a conversation with Eleanor Burke last week and, and her book hinges upon um, a woman with amnesia who doesn't know, has not signed, she was in an accident, a brain accident, and uh, traumatized her so you know she lost her memory and nobody has ever been able to identify her so it's like 10 years later and now she's grown up she was probably a teenager you know and you know you're pretty sure that at some point who she is is going to come and confront her but I mean I said to Alfie you know the, the problem with that today is that you you can hardly get away with that plot because one fingerprints data you know two dna right. ancestry.com you know take a sample or, or just and a three fa a facial search well, on facebook exactly I mean, yeah. that's what i was going to say or three increasing you know use of facial recognition so the really handy mystery plot of the amnesiac victim who wakes up you know and nobody knows they don't know who they are nobody else knows who they are and it all kind of goes from there it's another plot like the missing heir right. being shot down I by know. technology you know so you have to adapt but but you know, where you have Peter is excellent in the sense that you can reasonably say there is no cell phone coverage, so he's on his own. Well, and Peter also tends to lose his phone a lot, uh, conveniently <laughs> for, for the, the author. Um, <laughs> but it's, it is a problem. I've, I've, actually, I've talked to any number of, of writers about this and how it has made it really hard to, yeah. to tell all kinds of stories um, and how nice it would be to write a story set in the 70s, you know, back when there were pay phones and... Well, I think people are. Alfred actually set this book, I think she said, in the 90s. I mean, it wasn't right. super contemporary because she already thought about, right. you know, can I credibly, right. you know, do this story in, in today? Yeah. Well, the, the other problem, though, is when you're writing a series is that there's a point at which, you know, you have to sort of say, well, I mean, if I were Peter, I would at a certain point figure out that maybe I should stop getting into, you know, these life-threatening troubles, right? Um, Peter's a bright guy. You'd think that, you know, something would click. And he, but, but that's not what a crime series is, right? Peter has to keep making these, these bad decisions or good decisions that turn out badly. Um, and, and there's a point at which you, you know, as the author, you just sort of have to say, well, I guess Peter doesn't learn his lesson. Well, come on. You know, we've talked about Reacher. Reacher is the guy walking down the street by the dry cleaner and somebody right. stumbles out and there he is. He doesn't give a thought <laughs> to what you're so right, I don't right. know I don't know that you need to. I think the reader goes with it and expects this to happen. But but Reacher You don't want him to apologize for it. No. No, but Reacher doesn't that's one of the things that I think Lee does beautifully, um, and now Andrew is doing beautifully, is that Reacher doesn't evolve. Right, Reacher is is a static character. Right, he doesn't change from book to book. Um, yeah, yeah, he's still yeah he's still on the way to Omaha. Um, <laughs> right, and and it's and, and single. Uh, right, and single. <laughs> yep. Uh, and I mean, there are a couple of books where there's there are some of those. He yeah, makes some of a, those motions, but they don't stick. No, and there's a couple where it's passed in the army and so right, forth. Right, right. You know, or a family thing. There's at least one book I think with his father. And all, but you know, but basically, he's a man. There's no memory right, in the Reachers, right. which I think is a good way to describe. But, it. but I, it, I think it's really hard as a writer to do that. I think mm -hmm. it's really hard to to do that and have it feel so fresh and so original every time. Um, and, and you know, I that originally my thought was to sort of say, well, Peter's just gonna, you know, that that he's not gonna change from book to book. But I just couldn't. Do it. I, I, in part, I just kind of wanted to see what was going to happen, and in part too, the the sort of the fever pitch of that post traumatic stress in the first book, I don't think was sustainable over the long haul either. Um, so that's also part of Peter's journey is that his 
he, he's a he's a combat veteran. He's got post traumatic stress that takes the form of claustrophobia. But um, he, he's working on it, right? He's trying to become a better person, as he says, um, and also to live a live a, a larger life, a more full life. Um, I mean, that's kind of how Peter is evolving, but I, I, I think it's really hard to do that static character, especially now. Yeah, but you don't want him to evolve to the point where he doesn't do any of the things well, that no, make us want to read about it. Because then he's like an accountant in Poughkeepsie, and that's <laughs> not very interesting. <laughs> right. Are you, are you also, are you aging? You're not really aging him in real time, right? It's more like month to month? Uh, yeah, I don't, yeah, he's... You I, can't age him in real time. It will all go south. No, although there's a point at which... You know, Peter, as a somewhat recent uh, uh, veteran, like something has to sort of shift, like how Elvis Cole, the uh, Robert Crace, great Robert Crace character, um, at a certain point was no longer a Vietnam vet. Um, Spencer's a Korean War vet. Well, we're I know it. Talking about him on Saturday, you know, he's really a hundred and whatever, right. and still working out at the gym. Right. You know, yeah. <laughs> Read, readers go with it, you know. Um, I don't. I think you really do have to move Peter very, very slowly through time, because if if he is on a journey, you're going to get him to his destination too fast, and then we won't be able to carry on. Well, or else there. I, I think you're right. I think you don't want too much evolution, because then that really becomes the primary story mm -hmm. as well, um, and that's that's really the you know sort of the secondary thing is what's going on with Peter, or Peter and June. Uh, as well as kind of how are they, how is their relationship evolving? Yeah, well, I mean, what's so interesting about Peter is the fact that he steps in and helps people, you know? I mean, and you don't, you don't want to lose that, but I mean, if he settles down, you know, he has a job, and I mean, once you start getting self-protective, you know, then there's less of that possible. So, I mean, he's kind of like a knight errant, you know, wandering around. Just on his in his trusty steed yeah. called the truck, right? Um, right. You know, um, and even knight errants had girlfriends. Sure. Well, and and the goal again is to, you know, is to get to sort of explore part of what I enjoy is, is about sending them in different places is to really dig into what those places are, right. and and to think about you know to to sort of pick a place and to think about what are the stories that that kind of place. Uh, would engender, and, and so like my version of Memphis, right, where I'm I'm writing about a, a homeless musician kid, right. So that is that is my version of Memphis, right. That is not, uh, it's not John Grisham's Memphis, um, but it, you know, but it it suggests a kind of plot and a kind of story, and and that's the other fun thing is to is to dive into place in those ways. So is that what you do? Do you decide on the place and then work on the story? Or do you think of a story idea and then figure out a place that fits it? I know about Iceland because you well, were there, but... It's mostly, it's, it's a little bit of both. Um, and the, the, the place, I sort of start with a place and an idea, but then the idea often changes. So like the Memphis book was supposed to be, so the Memphis is, is in the middle of what's called the New Madrid Fault Zone, which is the uh, this giant earthquake zone that has not fired since the 1800s. Right, which was the worst earthquake ever experienced in the United States. That's right, and the Washington Monument moved, uh, you know, however many hundreds of miles away that was. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but so I sort of thought that was going to be kind of a man against nature book, sort of a disaster book. Um, and Peter would go there and, and would have to, you know, go help people who were in trouble and blah, blah, blah. But the earthquake never showed up because I fell in love with this street musician I started writing about. And then suddenly, sort of, it was it was about Peter and the kid and, and a friend of June's who Peter had gone to help. Um, so they, it, it's, I, I start out intending to do one thing and I end up doing something else entirely. Where it took you, so to speak. Yeah. So you got to Nebraska, you're driving around, mm -hmm. soggy land and the whole bit. Did mm -hmm. you just see a vision of this woman coming towards you? No, so I, I wrote, I wrote the Helene piece, that, that first couple you of chapters. That first? Um, and then I thought, I mean, I, I really liked her. I mean, the reason why she is such, has such a large role in the book is she just sort of kept showing up again. Um, cause she's, she's, um, I don't know. She's, she's, she's kind of something special for me. Um, but I sort of thought I, I can't, how, how does this become a Peter Ash book? Like I couldn't, I couldn't see how this was going to work. Like she just seemed too big. Uh, so then I wrote another beginning of a different book, okay. but, and it wasn't 
as good. And then I wrote a third beginning, and it was still worse. And and I just I'm glad you didn't get discouraged. No, well, no, it's kind of the story of my life. Um, and so I just thought, well, maybe I should go to Nebraska. So I threw my crap in the minivan and and I and I drove. Um, and that was the thing that sort of clarified that this really was a book about Helene. And here is how here is here is how she's going to connect to Peter. And this is sort of what the whole feeling of the story is going to be like when you're in that landscape. Mm -hmm. um, it really shifts. Um, for me, it, it shifts how I think about things. Um, and I'm, it's not like I'm taking notes and interviewing people, and I'm just sort of wandering around talking to myself. It's a very sophisticated research process. Mm -hmm. well, at least you went there. I did. Yeah, yeah. a certain feeling of authenticity. Yeah. So now that you're back in middle America, are you, do you already have a concept for where he's going next? I'm trying you don't to, want decide. to talk about it. Well, I, I, it's yeah. I'm I'm not far enough to really have a clue. Um, I I'm trying to decide, and I, I. How about the hostile desert landscape that surrounds Scottsdale, Arizona? <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun. Well, I think I have to do another city book, so it could be. Why? Well, because the last one was so rural. So. I don't know. It's just kind of what's. Calling my name. You don't want to tick tock like no, that. No, that's true. Come on. That's true. I don't know. It's it's. I know it's a Lewis book. Oh, okay. So so Lewis is Peter's best friend. He's a, a career criminal who's sort of gone straight, sort of not really. And really useful. Yes, yes. Lu, Lu, Lewis is uh, Lewis is an excellent dude. Nails the model. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Well, so so Lewis is often helping Peter, and so Lewis steps into Peter's world, and so this is the book where Peter helps Lewis, and we step into Lewis's world. Okay. So the question is, it, I know that it begins in Milwaukee, and I don't, I, I, I have a couple of options for where it's going to go next, but I, I really don't quite. You're not I'm, there yet. I'm, I'm banging my head against it currently. Okay. I like the idea of it being a Lewis book. I like Lewis a lot. Yeah, that would be great. Because June had a pretty large role in the last book, if I remember. She did. She did. She she had uh, there's about twenty percent June in her from her point of view in the last one. Mm -hmm. um, and that's you know that's the other thing that's really fun about this series is to dive into other characters and to really um, to to and I, I don't know if I don't know how much I mean I don't think I'll do something where another character has fifty percent. Of the pages, like like with this book, um, or maybe not quite yet, but it was really fun to do something that that dove into somebody else in, in that kind of way. Okay, so given your fairly eclectic work history before <laughs> you started writing, didn't I put that nicely? Yes. Um, have you thought about you know writing something other than Peter, or you know just as a little break? Or, or is Peter still so fascinating you haven't been driven to think about another character? Well, I, I proposed a different, uh, a standalone book to my publisher, and they said, well, I'm sure this would be wonderful, but we really want more Peter. <laughs> Especially um, after the New York Times review. Well, this was before the New York Times oh. review, but, but they read this book, and my, my editor uh, and my agent both kind of uh, uh, were over the moon and said, no, no, we need to really do some more. Peter. So I'm in, in part the the Lewis book is sort of some of the ideas from the standalone book, um, which is really about sort of the uh, a more criminal uh, uh, sort of emotional landscape, um, okay. which is Lewis's past. Um, so I, I don't know. It, it's it's I'm having fun. I'm just still at a stage where um, I, I, it's not that I haven't found my footing yet. I don't know. Maybe I haven't found my footing yet. Beginning a book is a weird process, um, especially when you don't start with an outline, which I, I wish I could work that way. Well, everybody works differently, you know. Mm -hmm. We've had this discussion over oh, yes, many 32 times. years. Many, you know? many Every times. writer yeah. has his or her own truth in, you know, system that works, and it's not transferable. No, it's not. Although it's one of the, for me, it's one of the fun things to talk with other writers about is kind of how do you work and, and what works for you. Um, and sometimes it's you know nuts and bolts stuff like Greg Hurwitz has these two monitors that he uses, so he's got notes on one and he's got the book on the other and he's going back and forth and you know that never occurred to me to do something like that. Um, 
you know, uh, Mark Rainey is, you know, he wants to, his goal to be at his, his, at his laptop uh, within 15 minutes of getting out of bed. Uh, five minutes if he can do it. So it's like, you know, it no just, coffee on the way. Well, I'm sure there's a coffee maker on, in the, uh, along the way, but I just think that's a really interesting. It's really interesting to to yeah. me how other people work, um, and I've learned a lot uh, from other writers along uh, along the way about, and it's informed how I work. So it's and one how of the, do you work? Um, I am a I am a morning person. I'm not a morning person, but I'm a morning writer. Okay. Um, and and. Uh, you know, I'm I'm at the computer uh, within an hour of getting up. I don't check my email. I don't listen to a podcast. I try not to have a very complicated conversation with my wife. Um, Is that possible? Um, some days. Some days. Some days. Um, I I married an extrovert, which is for a writer sometimes slightly challenging. Um, and and she would argue that marrying a writer was challenging. Because um, you weren't a writer when you married, when you got married. I was actually. Were you? Um, yeah, I was not a published writer. But, oh, okay. Um, yeah. Um, but um, and I I drink some coffee. I eat some oatmeal, and I I work until uh, the coffee expires, and then I eat a little lunch, and I go for a walk, and then I go back to work. Um, now I treat, sort of treat it like a nine to five. Um, that's kind of the what, what gets me to keep my butt in my in the seat, uh, and I tend to work six days a week, sometimes seven, depending on how, how close the deadline is uh, as well. Um, and I go back and forth. Sometimes I'm working on with two monitors and sometimes it's one, but I have a big uh, artist notepad that I use yeah. for drawing diagrams and sort of figuring out plot ideas. I, you know, there's, you're, the, with no lines, you can draw arrows and sort of scribble around the margin and it looks like it's sort of a mad scientist diagram. Or a kindergartner. Absolutely. So once you develop the voices, you know, for, for Peter and then Lewis and then June, that um, that's a solid base that you've got to work with. And then you just have to work on new characters and new voices. But at least you have some stability. Well, and it's it's interesting. Writing a series is, is I've, I've, I've had this conversation with other writers, too, where um, they sort of say, oh, writing a series, you, you already know who your characters are. You already know the, you know, the kinds of stories you're telling. And that, that's true, that there is that, uh, you have a place to start, but um, you also sort of say, well, I haven't, I've done this idea. And the, 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 the more books I've written, the more it's like, so, okay, I've done that, I've done that, I've done that. And so it's harder to, you can't sort of lean on your reflexes anymore. Okay. Um, you have to sort of develop things in a, in a different way, almost out of a whole cloth, as opposed to sort of saying, well, let's see, I've always been interested in X, Y, or Z. Um, whereas, I, you know, I, I think, you know, for people who write series, we sort of think, oh, a standalone, how freeing. And they're like, are you kidding? You have to invent the whole universe with every book. Um, so it's a, I don't know, it's an interesting it's an interesting Some people process. Really, really like world building, and other people, you know, do yeah. not. I think The Runaway is a terrific book, and it's interesting that in a long series, somewhere oftentimes around book seven, there's like a lift. I don't know exactly how to explain it, but series tend to, to either progress or die somewhere right around this book. You know, they either, it's like, you know, streaming television, whatever it is, you know, you know, those right, whatever the season seasons, is, yeah. and then there you are. Um, and I definitely sense a lift. Well, thank you. I in the runaway, that. I appreciate that. I did. I really enjoyed it. Um, it you know, it's different. It was surprising. It's very pacey. Um, it's it's just a really neat book. I hope you all are going to enjoy it as much as I did. How about questions from any of you? You're all stunned by our eloquence and <laughs> all that, guys. <laughs> oh. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, you, you talked about how the characters you tried different forms with them already. Does that put you in the in the straight jacket a little bit in terms of what their attitude would be to a certain situation that they've exhibited already? You have to keep track of all that. You know what I'm saying? No, that that's a that's a great question. The the question is really. Um, do be, because I know who the characters are, do, do they have to behave in a certain way? Uh, no, because they're all evolving, right? So, so, um, and their relationships to each other are evolving. And the, the funny thing is that, I mean, this this series has a has a really big female readership, and um, I think it's because of the characters. It's because um, 
people really care about who these folks are and how they interact with each other. And real people are not static, right? I mean, if, if you if you're have a cardboard cutout character who is all uh, rugged good looks and chiseled abs, you know, there's, you know, they are who they are because there's, they're, they're already, you know, there's, there's, there's not a lot of there there. But, but as characters get more complicated, and, and that's one of the nice things about writing a series is you, you can really continue to develop the characters as you go. And then so there, people aren't consistent. Not everybody, I mean, I'm not terribly consistent. Um, and relationships evolve and people have disagreements or, um, you know, things change. Um, and that's part of the fun with every book, and that's one of the early questions I ask myself. So, like, where are Peter and June? You know, what, what is their relationship like at the beginning of this book? Um, and if I know, I need to know that, and I need to know uh, kind of, you know, is, is Peter kind of in an up or down phase, right? Is he, is he uh, feeling better, or is he feeling, uh, you know, is the, the post-traumatic stress sort of coming back? Is it getting worse? Um, so and those are the things that sort of help me figure out, you know, kind of the, the tone and the feeling of the book. Um, so no, I, I, I don't think, I don't, I don't feel trapped by the characters at all. Um, and also you, you, get to, you get to throw in new characters, right? So, um, you know, the, the, you, you, they're all bouncing off each other. And so it's all, it, it, gets, it gets nice and nice and chewy in there. It's a very technical writer term, I think, but yeah. Chewy. I like Chewy, that. yeah. yeah. Excellent yeah. verb for writing. Yes, yes ma'am. Well, do you ever delve into his childhood or anything to see how he evolved into going into the military or anything? Um, I, I have um, an idea for Peter at like 15 or 16. Mm -hmm. um, and we know a little bit about Peter's parents. Mm -hmm. Um, his parents actually took in, they, they, Peter grew up in uh, northern Wisconsin, outside of a town called Bayfield, um, which is a sort of summer tourist destination, you know, kind of surrounded by farms and national forest. Um, and Peter's parents, his dad was a carpenter. Uh, he and his, his dad and his uncle have a home building business together. Um, and so his parents took in troubled kids, strays. So if you, if you, uh, find yourself 15 and pregnant and kicked out of the house by your parents, um, you, you go to the Ash House. Um, so that's part of where Peter has gotten his, um, uh, his sort of sense of stepping in and doing the right thing, um, is, is from his, his, how he grew up. But I would like to see what, that, what Peter is like at that age mm -hmm. um, and to see that formation a little bit. Um, so, so, so you have two choices. You can write a prequel, or you can write a book in which his past history has to be revealed right, right, as part of the narrative. Right, right. And, you know, my experience is with almost any long-running series, the author is always driven to writing a prequel of some kind because he, he just picked an arbitrary time to meet this character, and then when you get to know him, it just develops that way. Right. You know, right. that you want to go back earlier. So, right. you know, you've got different ways that you can do it. Did you have a question over there, sir? Did I see? No? No hand raising? No? Everybody through with questions? Wonderful. Well, in that case, let me thank you very much for coming. Let's give our author a round of applause. Okay. It's so exciting to do this. I know. Thanks you know, for coming. Our, our skill set has dramatically um, lessened in doing events. <laughs> so uh, we've, we've really laughed at ourselves how inept we've become. But I see that some of us remember about moving the chairs. So thank you very much. Um, you want to move behind me sure. to this nifty little table?